Well, we decided because people's testimonies are so upbuilding. David's been with us, what is it, five months now, just under five months. Yeah. And uh, we get Methodist ministers coming and preaching to us, but it's always interesting to hear their story. So we had quite an interesting conversation on the telephone, didn't we, earlier we in did. the week? We did. And um, could you start just by telling us about your early beginnings, David? Because yeah, I know sure. that I know you didn't, you don't come from a Christian background. And um, just tell us about when you were a little boy and the family yeah. that you grew up in, your mum and your dad, and also okay. your grandparents. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I've shared some testimony before, so my apologies <laughs> if uh, you've heard some of this, uh, but I don't come from a Christian background at all, uh, none whatsoever. Um, I'm an only child. Um, Mum and Dad um, came from uh, the West Midlands, so we lived in the black country. I was born in Dudley. Um, much to my mother's disgust, by the time I went, was a teenager and went to secondary school, I picked up the black country accent, which uh, sent both parents into a tailspin. Because uh, when you talk like that, <laughs> you do sound very posh and you certainly no, don't you sound very intelligent. You be a little bit careful here, David, because there's at least one person in the congregation who comes from the West Midlands. Well, I have to tell you, I'm intensely proud of where I come from. The black country is a great place with great people who are huge-hearted and generous and um, pig-headed and stubborn. So that's where I get it from. I'm sure. So we didn't, I, you know, we didn't go to church, no church going background. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But I, I, I discovered sort of later on that um, there were Methodists in the family. Uh, so when I was uh, christened, uh, I was given this, this Bible, uh, which is a really treasured possession. It's one of those that's got uh, pictures in it. Uh, some wonderful pictures. Uh, so here's, and look at what it says, uh, Joseph, note, and his brethren. <laughs> there he is. But in the flyleaf uh, to this, it says, uh, a gift to my dear godchild, David William, on the occasion of his christening, March the 8th, 1959. St. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 12, from his great uncle Tom, who I never met. But he had the, uh, the wit and the wisdom to, to give me this in the hope that it would have an impact uh, on me. Uh, and he never got to tell me why, Paul. He'd, he'd done that. Um, but was Uncle Tom a member of your family? I mean, you said he was, you were his godson. Was yeah, I mean, he a... was my dad's um, side of the family. I think my grand, maternal grandmother's side of the family. Um, but my grandmother, mater uh, paternal, sorry, paternal grandmother, she was a Methodist. Yep. Um, she uh, married her sweetheart, and they'd been married six weeks in 1916 when he was sent to the Somme, uh, and he died. Um, and then after the war, she married um, Henry, who had been a machine gunner yep. in the trenches. Yep. Um, and he was quite a violent man to my dad. So um, what sort of effect did that have on your dad? Um, shattering, really. I think he, well, put it, put it this way. I mean, he, he developed schizophrenia and he lived with that all his adult life. And he was an alcoholic. Um, and then when he was, I guess, in his 30s, uh, just after I'd come along, he developed chronic asthma just at a time when cortisone was only just coming in and that saved his life, thanks to a very um, forward-thinking consultant. So he, he had a dreadful childhood. He was an only child. And so his dad used to beat him up until my dad was 16 and then one day threw a punch back. And that was the end of that. Uh, his dad didn't beat him up anymore. So, so dad was, he, he, he had a heart as big as a bucket. He was a very loving person, but he was broken. Yeah. And he just struggled all of his life. Uh, mum's side of the family, they were living in Wolverhampton. Uh, my mum's mum died when she was 11. So that had a huge impact on my mum. Uh, so we, we sort of stayed in the area, really. 
um, and there were the three of us uh, um, living our lives. And of course, with Dad's illness, um, that meant it was quite challenging as a kid. Mm. You know, Dad was out every night down the pub, twice on a Saturday, twice on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, so he was drunk a lot of the time, really. Um, and that, that was a struggle because they were always arguing, they were always rowing. Um, just incessantly, it seemed to me. And so when, when it was really tough, and when I could read, yeah. I'd pick this up, and it, it still falls open at St. John 8, um, chapter 8, verse 12. Yeah. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, and I really wanted that, Paul. You know, I, you know, I understood what that meant, even though I understood no theology, because you don't need theology to get that, do you? You know, we know what light and dark is, and I was in a dark place, um, and I was really wanted that, but I hadn't a clue how to get it. Yeah. You, you did mention that there was a time when you got given a cross, I think, as a present. There was, but, yeah. yeah. When I was uh, a teenager, about sort of 13, coming up 14, um, because I don't think God lets you go. No. I think God was reaching out to me and wanted to make contact. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we didn't come across sort of any Christians who said they were Christians and wanted to take an interest. I guess our family wasn't the sort of family, you, you know, with Dad being as he was, anybody wanted to come near, really, so we were pretty isolated. Um, so at 14, I just had this strong sense that I wanted a cross. Mm. Um, now, this is somebody who doesn't go to church. <laughs> you know, so, um, and I just had this really profound sense. I wanted one. So plucked up courage, said to mum and dad, look, I'd really like one. And they sort of looked at me as though I'd dropped from above, I think. You know, they were really surprised. But bought me one, bless them. Mm. You know, they pushed the boat out and they bought me this cross. And I was really pleased. And I had, again, this strong sort of compulsion, this really daft idea as you do, that I should go down to the parish church and get the vicar to bless it. Does that make me sound really bonkers? No. You know, but it was one of those things. I think God was just saying, come on, come and get in touch. Um, but, of course, you know what I did, don't you? I bottled it. I just didn't have the courage to go down and, and see the vicar and say, would you bless this for me? But I think that was God just really wanting to reach out and take me in hand. Why was it spe so special to you to have the, the cross blessed? Well, it, it, I think it was something about God loving me, God reaching out to me, yeah. um, because I, I, as it were, I, I reached out and asked for it and was given it, yeah. and I wanted what was then, I hoped, would come back the other way, which was that God would reach out to me, yeah. and going and asking for that blessing was about being accepted by God because by that sort of stage, you know, I didn't have much self-confidence. I didn't have much self-worth. Um, you know, home life, I guess, just gifted, in a sense, that sort of to me. So I was pretty mixed up. But you mentioned that eventually you obviously went through schooling and then went off to uni. Yeah. And I think I'm right in saying, aren't I, that you did science subjects. I did, yeah, you yeah. Met Sue I at did. uni. Well, yeah. Just tell us a bit about that, because obviously you're a Methodist minister. Indeed. You did, I think, was it geology and biology? Well, what I did, do you remember David Bellamy? Those of a certain age, David Bellamy. Yes. Oh, really <laughs> remarkable. Oh, really. He was, and he was, on, and you can tell, he was on a Sunday morning with his ecology programme, and I was transfixed. I just loved ecology, and, mm. and having seen that, it, because I loved biology, I loved geography and, and chemistry, and I just got really enthused by this enthusiast whose enthusiasm was infectious. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I really want to do that because I'd known long since. I mean, I was uh, rubbish at maths. Um, I had loads of sort of chest infections and ear infections as a kid. And it always seemed to be at the time of year when you're starting a new class and I missed out and my maths was absolute rubbish. So I knew, you know, any hopes of being a medic, that went out the window because I just knew I was never going to reach that standard. And with my skill at DIY, thank heavens, I didn't become a medic, really. You know, it could have been disastrous for a poor patient. So ecology was what really fired me up. So I said, OK, how do I go and do this? 
So I got a place at Birmingham for biological sciences mm. and geography and a place at Reading for botany and zoology. Um, got the A-levels, went to Birmingham, and there were three of us reading for that degree yeah. on, on our course, just three of us. But it was great, joint honours degree, the best of both worlds, and I, I just loved ecology. But that was a kind of milestone for you, wasn't it? In a way, oh going yeah. to uni, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you told me about meeting Sue. Just Absolutely. Tell us about her well, and, do you know, I mean, you can imagine, I, I couldn't wait really to get away from home and just get, get the independence. So it was fantastic going to uni. And at um, the end of first year, um, went to a party in one of the halls of residence. Um, so there were loads of biologists there, loads of chemists there, and biochemists. And Sue, uh, was reading medical biochemistry uh, at Birmingham. And we were at this party, and I, I can remember, we, as, as you did in those days, it was in somebody's bedroom, and it was packed. And I was sitting on the end of the bed, and I sort of looked over, and I saw this gorgeous woman sitting down there, and she caught my eye, and she offered me a drink of martini. It's a very Methodist story. <laughs> a drink of martini, shaken, not stirred, as the song said. Um, and I said, I really don't like martini, uh, you know, but I really like you. So um, we started going out together. And it must have been several months before she finally fessed up that her dad was a Methodist minister, you know, because she really didn't want to say that because she thought it would be the kiss of death, um, having to admit that. Because she was in that phase of sort of rebelling, having only ever known living in a manse. She was enjoying her freedom. Um, but I had said to her, look, I'm really searching. I want to find out more. Yeah. So bless her, she packed up her rebellion in her old kit bag, put it on, under the bed, and she took me to Selly Oak Methodist Church, which was huge, you know, modern building, uh, pews in a semi, in what's pews then, in the semicircle, uh, with a great minister, a great university chaplain, huge meth sock, and the first time I walked in that place, Paul, on a Sunday morning, it felt like coming home. Mm -hmm. And what really struck me was um, the worship was accessible. You know, it was in language I understood. Um, and there was a guy in a donkey jacket halfway up one of the aisles leading the prayers, a lay person. I just thought, this is for me. And it felt like a piece of a jigsaw clicked into place. Yeah. And I, we got to meet some of Mathsock. Uh, and hooked up with them, and there were just loads of people my own age, and it was just brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. I just want to ask you, did you come to know Jesus sort of in a, a flash, you know, the twinkling of an eye, or was the it something that evolved? Uh, more of an of evolution, okay. yeah, more of an evolution for me at that stage, just growing into this absurd idea that God loved me. You know, how on earth could God love me? How could that be possible? You know, but God did, and I was being told that God did. I was being told about God's grace, being told you know, that Jesus' love for all of us, told about the Holy Spirit, and it was just wonderful. You know, I couldn't get enough of it. Yep. Um, and so it was, it was a slow process of coming to believe, um, yeah, God did love me and wanted me. So how do you become a Christian by the time you left uni? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, well... Yes, I, I'd, say, I'd say because <laughs> it took me a while to leave. Uh, let me put it that way. So I graduated um, and then started a three-year research contract in the geography department, uh, looking at uh, in Viking settlement, uh, the impact of Viking settlement on the Icelandic ecosystem, as you do. Uh, so that was a three-year contract, and my job was looking at fossil beetles. Uh, I had a colleague who looked at pollen and seeds. We had an Icelandic historian and we had an archaeologist. And the boss was a polymath. He was just really great. Um, so I was part of a multidisciplinary team. Um, and that involved a field season in, in Iceland. Um, for We had about eight weeks in Iceland, I think it was. Uh, most of which was spent in a tent in a peat bog. <laughs> right, okay. uh, and when you're sitting in a tent in a peat bog, and it's 24 hours daylight, don't forget, it concentrates the mind. And halfway through that, I mean, I'd taken some William Barclay to read. And I, just halfway through, because it was wet, it was miserable. Um, you know, it's hard work. You're just digging sections out of sides of a peat bog all day long and bagging the stuff up, labelling it, 
while you know, the lecturers are having a great time going around Iceland enjoying themselves and you're stuck in this peat bog. And uh, one night there was a herd of cows came through at one in the morning, trampled my colleague's tent. So she had to come into my tent and there, there were only one person tents. So it was a bit of a nightmare, one way and another. But you know, it's good fun. It's what you do when you're that age. But I just had this niggling, growing feeling of dissatisfaction. You know, because I was passionate about research, but I was beginning to see it wasn't the be all and end all. And yeah. for me, I was starting to feel dissatisfied. I thought that I had a really strong sense that, that God wanted me to do more. So I, I came back from Iceland and uh, went to see the university chaplain and just told him, I said, look, I've just, just had this experience in Iceland. I just feel God wants me to do something else. And bless him, he, he said, do you know what? I've got the perfect thing. They need a deputy warden at Methodist International House in Sally Oak. So I moved in there as deputy warden. Um, there were about 23 nationalities in there. Um, it was coming up towards the time of the Falklands War. You know, we had Russians in there. You know, everybody, Poles. Um, and it was just a fantastic cosmopolitan mix of people. Uh, in this place, and that, that was a really good place to go and reflect on faith. Um, do you want me to just? Well, I just, uh, I'm, I'm thinking obviously about time because it would be I'll sit here all night, maybe, you you know, if you want me to. <laughs> I just want to jump forward, really, because I know that as a result of that, you ended up in the Methodist ministry, I'm which is quite an. About my course I know. In oh, well, you just tell us about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one day I was walking to the lab, um, going from the um, Methodist International House to the university, which was about a 20 minute walk. And the sun was shining. It was a lovely, bright, crisp morning. And the sun just came through. And all of a sudden, I just felt overwhelmed by the light. Just absolutely overwhelmed and filled with the light and this incredibly strong sense of God actually just saying to me, I want you to be a minister, yep. which was the last thing on earth I expected. Yep. The last thing I expected for anybody like me with my background. And I thought, what? What? And was really quite just taken aback. So again, went to see the minister who sent me to see the superintendent um, because I couldn't make sense of this, but they could. And so we, we had several conversations and they said, OK, you know, we think God's calling you. Uh, you need to become a local preacher. Oh, right. OK. Uh, so I had to start on the, the local preachers course. Um, and I, I shared this with Sue, uh, which, you know, she said she never wanted to marry a Methodist minister. Uh, and we were just getting married. Um, so you can imagine. But she was really supportive. Uh, family and, and my family, once they picked themselves up off the floor, uh, were supportive. And so that felt really vulnerable, but pursued that call. Uh, by this time, I'd started a second research contract in the geology department. Um, so I candidated, went all the way through to Connectional Candidates Committee, which was meeting in, as it happened, in Birmingham at Queen's. Um, and, and it seemed to be going really well. Um, and I was honest with them. I said, look, I'm 98% you know, I'm there, yes. But there's just 2% niggling me, which says if I candidate now and go in, I'll never have the opportunity to finish my PhD. Um, and, and I was just troubled by the, <coughs> would I regret it? Would it always be a what if? Mm -hmm. Should I have done? So I was just honest and shared it with them. And bless them, they said to me, we think you should go and finish it, then come back. So they said, not yet. Which, which was a blow, but it was the right thing to say. And so about two years after that, I candidated again, much harder that time, was given a much rougher ride that time, um, but got through. Mm -hmm. And so in 1986, uh, I submitted my PhD in the summer. We then moved to Cambridge, um, three years to train. Uh, and I started um, the degree in Cambridge that autumn. So I went from <laughs> one discipline to another. Um, 
and I have the distinction of being only the second person in the history of Wesley House to fail Greek. <laughs> it's my badge of honour, I failed Greek. Uh, but I managed to scrape, I think they gave me pity marks to get me through the degree, because you had to pass it, or else you, you wouldn't graduate. Uh, but I loved it, it was a great time, fantastic. I just want to ask, I think everybody's probably thinking it, about, you know, obviously Christianity and science. Have yeah. You, yeah. Has, has this been helpful to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm a committed scientist and a, and a committed Christian, and I see absolutely no problem betwixt and between mm. the two. And as a biologist, you know, who accepts evolution um, and all scientific explanations, I have absolutely no, no trouble at all, never have yep. had in that sense, um, with, with, with science and, and my faith. You know, because, I mean, you know, for me, being a scientist was, was understanding the creation. Yes. You know, that God had birthed this amazing universe. And, uh, you know, we were understanding that, seeking greater knowledge of that. So, from my perspective, it wasn't denying God, it was actually increasing my awe and wonder about about God. I just want to I, I want to sort of wind this up slightly because okay. I know we've got communion to go, but and it'd be really That'll nice be to swift. continue this. Well, I'd like to continue this discussion <laughs> some future occasion, but okay. I, I just want to ask you about. Um, you said you were in prison ministry, yeah, and you said that on one occasion you felt you were looking evil in the face. Absolutely. And we're just about to, in a few yeah. weeks, do we Ephesians are. chapter yeah. 6. Yeah. So yeah. could you just tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So when I left college in 1989, uh, we said to the college principal, we're really happy to go north. Uh, and Ivor, I think, didn't have much sense of geography. And we used to think he held the atlas upside down because we were sent to Weymouth. And those, <laughs> those were the days, if a circuit couldn't get a minister... They'd ask for a probationer to do an ordained person's job, which we just do not do that anymore. So we were sent to Weymouth, and I had six churches and a prison chaplaincy. So the prison chaplaincy was the Vern Prison on Portland, which was a Category C prison. About a third of the, the inmates were life sentence yes. prisoners who'd moved out of Cat A and Cat B. So they were... They were 12, 14 years or so, maybe 20 years into their sentences. So that they came to the Vern. Um, and the, the prison officers actually were really quite pleased with that because the lifers used to keep the younger lads in check who might cause trouble because the lifers didn't want any trouble. They just wanted to finish their sentence. So they would keep the young hotheads down. And we had... Um, a really quite thriving attendance at chapel. But one of the things that, as a chaplain, you had to do uh, sometimes was uh, sit on a parole hearing. Um, and so I sat on a parole hearing one afternoon, um, and it was a life sentence prisoner uh, who was in for, I believe... I'm right in saying I think it was multiple murder and rape. Um, and so he came and sat down. Big chap. And there were four of us, I think, who, who were there to, to assess and just listen at this point as to whether he should be released. Um, and looking into his eyes, I was convinced I was actually... It, it's just about the only time it's happened... Mm -hmm that I was actually looking into the face of sheer evil and wickedness. I'd never experienced that before, but there, there was a, a coldness, there was an emptiness which seemed to suck the life out of the room. Um, and it was as though you know, the devil were there himself, mm. which I found really quite shocking. Yeah. And yet um, Jesus did come to overcome evil and the devil. And absolutely. And some lifers who oh, had come through. Absolutely. To um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we... Um, and presumably hope for that man as well. Well, you always have hope. Mm. But, you, you know, it's Jesus saying, you know, OK, you, but you've got to be as wise as well. Yeah. And so it's balancing grace with responsibility. Uh, and there was no way that guy should ever have been mm. let out. Yeah. It would always be a threat. Um, and that was clear. 
Uh, I mean, no remorse, no sense of empathy, none whatsoever. Um, but there were others who, and I can remember one, one guy who was probably by then in his mid-30s. He was great. Um, and we could take him out to church. We could take him out. He went to the local special school where the headmistress was a Methodist. Um, he'd just done something really stupid when he was a teenager and somebody had died. Um, and he was just full of remorse. He just wanted to have a full life and have another chance. And for him, Jesus had turned things around. And so, and so you saw you know, both ends of the spectrum. Lastly, I just want to ask you mm. about well, two things really, which mm. I know are quite important to you. And the first thing is um, your blogging, yeah, and, and also your photography, because yeah. those are things that you're really interested in that you do bring into your preaching, yeah, and yeah. your Christian life in general. Just to wind up, just tell us about that. Okay, okay, I'll get my props out. Uh, so, uh, I, for years and years and years, um, this is how I do my theology with a camera. Um, it's just second nature to me. It's, it's almost hardwired, I think, Paul, that when I have my camera with me, yeah, I will just see things and the meaning of what I'm seeing will just, just be there in a flash. Um, the theology behind it or what I might say using it. And so, you know, I try and have it with me um, because I think I'm just passionate about communicating Jesus to those who don't know him yet because of my background. You know, I don't want people to go through what I went through. Yeah. I want them to know Jesus as soon as they can. I'm just passionate about that. And I think images speak to people in a way that words don't so easily. And if you put image and word together, I think they really communicate. So I've always used my camera and, and images, uh, particularly when I lead retreats, yeah. um, but in worship. And... <coughs> When I became a district chair in Lincolnshire, I had a real conundrum. How on earth do you keep regular touch and contact with and speak to all the people in the district spread from the Humber to the Wash? Huge area, absolutely massive area. Uh, and I was having a chat in Waterstones uh, in Hull with one of the university lecturers who I knew was a Methodist. And I just said to him, this is really, how on earth might I do that? And he said, have you thought about blogging? Mm. I said, what's that? And he told me, I said, wow, that's great. So I went back, got set up um, on Blogspot with a blog. I called it Dave's District Blog and told the district. And so, you know, I would regularly put up posts using images, sharing theology, sharing, you know, love for Jesus and, and passion. And just did that for the whole time that I was there, for the 11 years I was in Lincolnshire as a way. And what I discovered was there were people all over the world then got in touch, you know, and you became part of a global Christian family. And for me, blogging was, was fantastic. And I don't often, but I will. Uh, so this, this is my bloggy. So 2009... Uh, the Premier Christian Media Awards down in London. Uh, I'd been nominated for Best Christian Blog, so I went down and, uh, and won it, which was fantastic. So, so this, sits, uh, this sits upstairs, um, which to me was just saying, let's embrace new technology and share the gospel mm. in ways that reach people. And that's what I'm passionate about the church doing. So blogging visual theology, photography. It's all a tool, Paul, uh, because I'm passionate about mission and passionate about evangelism. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, we're welcome. going to sing now. Right, uh, I should put my accoutrements so yeah, away. I'm, I'm really grateful to you, David, for sharing that with us. We feel as if we know you a bit more now as a person rather than as a minister. And we shall continue this conversation I'd look forward at some to that. future date.